Clicking the buttons. All the go live buttons. Hi. Story of Bobby Like and subscribe. <laughs> Smash that bell. <laughs> All right, the bell. I forget about the bell. <laughs> It's because everybody says get the bell on, and I'm always like, why? <laughs> I don't understand. Why would I do such a thing? Do people do that? Like, is putting the bell on an actual thing? People really do it? Uh, I've, I've never, never put, put bells, bells on. on. Says the anti-notification team. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. All right, I got my outline, got my recordings. That was weird. Did you hear that? That was my throat. It did. Like, gurgling. <laughs> Sounded like, like a, a distant, distant tiger. tiger. A distant tiger. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's I don't I don't even know how I could pull that off again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Today's pen. There's there's a pen for the day. It's an orange one. Pen for the day. Yep. yep. This, this is, is an Esterbrook Junior. Uh, what, what do they call it? Sunrise. I can never get, get my camera, camera to focus on this though. though. There it goes. Okay. So, so Esterbrook has, has these custom, the in-house custom nibs that they do. Mm -hmm. So, so this, this is a scribe, they call it. It's like okay. an architect, but, but you can flip, flip it over and use it as a extra fine also. Got it. So it's like their version of an architect. Hi, Carol. Carol showed up. She heard fountain pen talk and <laughs> immediately showed up. You have an echo. It's because I didn't do this. That'll fix that. Sorry about that, Carol. It's probably only on Mike's voice would be my guess. Because I was dumb and didn't <laughs> mute it. Doubly. Whoopsies. Details. Speaking of being dumb and not muting things, let me turn Do Not Disturb on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All those things, right? <laughs> yeah. My phone, like, never dings or vibrates or anything because I have so much stuff that is turned off just by default for everything that it just, like, almost never, <laughs> it never notifies me for anything. <laughs> which is amazing and terrible at the same time. You should get one of those light phones. I've thought about it. You don't know how many. I I have talked about that for at least three years. I have. I was real close. Yep. It, it comes up regularly between my <laughs> wife and I. <laughs> yes. They have directions on it now. Yep. That's what I hear. But even that, I'm not terribly concerned about I am <laughs> but because if I'm doing trips and stuff I'm usually with my wife so we could use hers ah uh, yes that's true but at the same I time suppose. like I, I do too many like pulling up a server that's in the building while I'm at work and not having to go to my desk to do it like <laughs> that little basic thing goes a long ways It shouldn't be that big a deal, and yet it is. You got your nine-year-old granddaughter into fountain pens on Christmas Day. Well Hallelujah. Done. They're coming back, Mike. Fountain pens are coming back. <laughs> there's one. Uh, true. Well, there's a guy on our video team that discovered he my my desk is right beside the video desk here, and. He saw some of my fountain pens sitting out on my desk. I was like, what are those? And now he's into fountain pens. It's similar to what happened with you. Like, he saw some of my stuff. And I know I wasn't <laughs> the only one that got you into fountain pens. But he saw some of my stuff, went and looked it up. And then now he's more into it than I am. 
and he's 18. <laughs> Gotta watch these these youngins. You gave her one of your pink Lamy Safaris. As in you had multiple pink Lamy Safaris? Hmm. I call that success. I don't think Mike would argue with me. Nope. Well, should we hit record buttons, Mike? We probably should. Before we do, though, did you hear a whole bunch of background noise on my end? No. Sweet. All right, then we can hit record. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, apparently, Re Adelaide is pushing her stroller around upstairs, but uh, sounds like she's dumping out a herd of elephants, so I don't. I don't know exactly what's going on up there, but fun. That is what's going on up there, Mike. If you're not hearing it, then we should be good. If you are hearing it, I should go intervene. I don't hear it. So, All right. but I also don't have your voice crazy hot in my ears either. Hmm. Check, check, check. I mean, it's okay though, volume wise, right? Yeah, I uh, know. It's it's okay. me. I have you just don't have, have your headphones down. up super high. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right. Well, I think we can press buttons then. Okay. And make things. Make things. If you'd like. Make pretty things. Let me just real quick, in case I need this later, plug this guy in. I was doing that in a microphone during a sound check for somebody last week, <laughs> and they thought something was wrong with their system. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like any system malfunction I've ever heard. I know. I know. It's kind of, <laughs> usually it's like crackling feedback pops. Like that's usually what it is. Yeah. Not. That would be a very strange, very strange issue. Yes. Yes, it would. All right, I think I'm good. Okay. Ready to count down? Sure. Okie dokie. Three, two, one. Did you have a good Christmas, Mike? I did. Did you? I did. I'm ready for New Year's at the moment, though, because... It's the time of year when I get to tell everybody to don't make resolutions. <laughs> I approve this message. <laughs> Unlike Mike's claims of being the largest book club on the internet, and I disown that, uh, Mike will claim this one. Awesome. Good job, Mike. <laughs> don't make a resolution. If you ever, ever heard us say that, don't make a resolution. It's make, true. You just need to make tons of goals, right, Mike? Nope. Oh. Got it all wrong. <laughs> New okay. Year's resolutions are simply bad goals. If you're going, but both of them are not the right approach. I, I I would say this: if you're going to do anything at the New Year, figure out one new habit to put in place that's going to happen daily, and do that. And if you're going to identify one new habit to put in place, it should be read more books, uh, which should be second to listening to Bookworm. Well. That one's assumed that <laughs> you have that. Otherwise, you're never hearing this, I guess. But Okay, I don't know how we got on this. But this is Joe's brain on full speed uh, ADHD. But uh, we're not here to talk about New Year's resolutions, goals, habits, although that will probably happen frequently in the midst of this conversation about our book today. But before we do that, we have some follow-up to jump into, Mike. And I have a question. At least you put two questions as an action item. And that means that I get to ask you these questions. How are you doing with your future chasing mindset? What are you doing about it? Well, I'm not really doing a whole lot about it. Just trying to go with the flow at the moment. Okay. <laughs> Which um, shared some stuff with you. I'm kind of in the middle of a pretty big transition. And so I kind of have to take it a day at a time. <laughs> but uh, that has been good practice for me with this. But the spirit of this action item lives on, I think. Uh, the big thing, as I was thinking about this in particular with my situation right now, is just with my 
family with my kids specifically, I have shared before, we've got the family core values. We kind of work backwards, identified the kind of relationship we wanted to have with our kids and establish habits that would create that platform, things like that. And I'm happy that we did all that. I've talked a lot about the fruit that has come from those decisions that we made. But I also want to not do it in terms of creating a future outcome. I want to shift that focus a little bit more just to enjoying the moment. And uh, I think that's like a really minor thing that needs to happen because I do enjoy taking my kids to the coffee shop when we do our one-on-ones and playing games and just hanging out together. But I think the the little bit of a shift that needs to happen is like when I'm there, I'm just fully engaged with what we're doing and I'm not so worried about watching the clock because I got to get back for the next thing. Like the most important thing at that moment is just being with them. And uh, there's a balance there, obviously, because I got to show up to work. There's meetings I have to attend, et cetera. So uh, I don't think there's a, a real clear, like this is now done state associated with this, but it's been good for me just to kind of remind myself that this is the most important thing, uh, being there with my kids instead of thinking about the next thing that I have to be doing all the time. There's something I learned about our last book, and that is that it kind of infects your brain, whether you realize it or not. I don't know if you had this experience, Mike, but whenever I'm thinking about what time do I get off work? What time are we going to do X, Y, Z? Are we going to do this before that? And if we're doing something that's setting us up for next week, should we be doing that? Or better yet, if we're going to make a decision on something to put off doing something now so that we could do it in two years, should we really be doing that? Like Those seemingly innocent thoughts have infiltrated my brain many times a day even through this holiday season, like it's just been nuts to me that like, I can't help but think about, no, that's really not that important in the long run. Really doesn't matter. I'm going to play with the dog instead. So there's that. Anyway, it sounds like you're having a similar opinion of it. <laughs> yes. Yes, I am. Uh, there was just that one specific application of it for me over the last couple of weeks, because this is a little bit of weird timing for any sort of action item for me other than read more books because <laughs> I haven't been working. So that whole aspect of who I am and my identity has been put on pause essentially with the exception of recording the occasional bi-weekly podcast here. So even those I haven't really done a, a whole lot, everything's just kind of been put on pause and hanging out with family and, and reading books. Like I said, I, I cranked through, we were up in Door County for four days and I finished four books while we were up there. <laughs> Nice, nice, <laughs> nice work. Yeah, I did the opposite. Ended up not reading like at all over the the break. <laughs> that's, happens. That's usually the way. Like you have one of two directions you can go with that. Yep. It's uh, it's going to be multiplied <laughs> one way or the other. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, I had a single follow up action item, and that was to take the five questions that are at the end of last time's book, which was 4,000 weeks, um, I took those five questions and created a monthly review template inside of Obsidian. This might be the first time I'm the first to bring up Obsidian. And I created this monthly template and intend to ask those questions at the beginning of each month. And I say that, I don't even have them up in front of me, but my goal is to do that like one or two days before the month begins because I generally end up like deciding what big projects are going to happen that month. And I feel like asking these questions prior to deciding what projects are going to take the forefront for the month, like I just feel like that would put things in perspective a lot more. So haven't actually used it yet, but intend to here in the next day or two. And we'll see how it uh, how it comes through. Because as we're recording this, we're a little a couple days, three days before New Year's. Three days, two two days, something like that. Depends on which day you want to count. Uh, but yes, I'm prior planning... to the episode being released. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not released yet. <laughs> There's that. <laughs> but yes, I'm I'm working through that uh, process of how I'm going to do 
that monthly review. The weekly thing like non is non-existent. But monthly, I think I typically do in some form or another. So that one I know I'll at least do. Yes. Nice. All right. So that all said, let's jump into today's book, which is Thinking in Systems, which is a primer, as called out by Danella H. Meadows. Uh, or Donna, I believe, is how people referred to her. One thing to note very quickly about this one is that she passed away in 2001, and the book was published in 2008 because she wrote the first draft of it, but it wasn't actually finished and released and put together. So I just I just want to call that out because there was uh, another uh, editor that helped put this together to actually get it released, and that was Diana Wright. So although Donna's name is on the front cover, just be aware there's that element involved. So it's a little bit strange in some places because she's referencing things from like the late 90s or the turn of the millennium, and yet the editing was done seven years later. Or no, it would have been nine years later or something, something along those lines. I forget when she actually wrote the first draft, but I just felt it was a little bit weird just knowing that and working through it. Anyway, that's not super important. But the thing that I think is interesting about the book is that I've not really jumped into a book that thinks about systems in such an articulate way and the way that she lays out. So I think this will be a, a really interesting process because we're such systems people and habit people and routine people that breaking down systems into their component parts on a large scale I think is fascinating and I'm excited to work through that with you here today Mike well you say we are systems people although having read this I would argue we're not as systems people as we think we are no not at all like we we, we think of ourselves as systems folks but "Quote unquote systems thinking people." That's a whole different breed, apparently. Which I was we got unaware a long of. Long ways to go. Yeah, we haven't scratched the surface. I didn't even under like I understood it, but the basics at the very beginning I was like, "Oh, hadn't thought of it that way." Like, and I'm, yeah, not a systems person, apparently. <laughs> or at least you haven't gone to the school of systems thinking, which you mentioned that this book defines systems very articulately, I would argue that it defines systems very academically. This felt to me very much like a business textbook <laughs> from my business school uh, upbringing, where the business books that I had to read when I was going for my undergraduate degree, they kind of fell into a couple different categories. One was just easy for me to grasp for whatever reason. And oh yeah, that is kind of like logical. That makes sense. And the other one is like, this is all Greek to me, but I'm just going to stick with it. And by the end of the semester, hopefully it all comes together and I pass the tests. <laughs> That's what statistics was for me specifically. Uh, this one felt like that for me. <laughs> yep. As much as I thought I understood systems and you've got inputs, you got processes, you got outputs right at the beginning with all of the definitions and things. And yeah, it, it puts it together in a way that felt very foreign, at least uh, initially. And it did come together at the end, and we'll talk about the specifics here, but I'm kind of curious before we dive into any of the content. How did this book get on your radar? What was the process you went through in selecting this book? Yeah, because having read it, I'm not sure I would have selected it. <laughs> Where did this come from, if not business school? <laughs> was not business school. I honestly, I was cruising around Amazon and I had a bank of books that I was debating selecting from. And then in the recommended list, this one popped up and I read the description for it. I'm like, wait, systems thinking, that's a, like I've heard that term and I know that it's a technical thing. But I thought it was going to fall right in line with what you and I normally 
do. And in my head, this was some overarching book that would help us, I guess, bring a lot of those systems and the way that they come about together. And I thought it would be really cool to see like the overarching themes amongst systems and how they work. But that's technically true. Like that, that is in here, but on a very different level and in a very different uh, writing style than what I intended. So I'll say that. Anyway, all that to say, it was an Amazon recommendation. All right. Interesting. Which usually <laughs> serves me decent, but Amazon did me wrong in this case, I think. I don't think they did you wrong. It was just <laughs> interesting. Typically, they recommend other books that are similar to the ones that you've read. And this is not similar to any of the other books that we have read. And so it just felt a little bit like an outlier in terms of bookworm, at least. So it's kind of curious how it got on your your radar. Yeah, that's that's why I say Amazon did me wrong, because I feel like it doesn't fit in the category of what we normally do, and especially not in the category of what I've bought historically. So I don't know. <laughs> Good job, Amazon. <laughs> Not that there's anything wrong with that. No. So, uh, no. Yeah. So, yes, if we jump in here, let's go to uh, part one. So, this, this is a three part book. Surprise, surprise. We know that that's okay in some cases. Not always, but I think it's okay in this case. Uh, but part one is system structure and behavior. And the very beginning of that is as you would expect, the basics. And this is where she starts laying out some definitions of things, and she uses some terms here that give me trouble throughout the rest of the book just because of her choice in analogies. It's not wrong, per se. I just struggled with it because I have so many assumptions that jump around in my brain when you use these terms. And... Those terms are stock, inflow, outflow, and feedback loops. And I know of things like feedback loops, like you do something, you get feedback on it, and then you use that to decide what you're going to do next, and on and on we go. That part's fine. Inflow, outflow, I kind of get those. I have too much of like water systems in my head, so I, I all I see is like pipes. Again, not necessarily bad. However, the choice of the word stock, or she uses like resource sometimes, I, I get that that's probably the one of the best terms she could probably use. If you're in an academic sense, I'm sure that they've thought this through in a lot of detail. But I can't help but see like the stock market because I was, you know, I had a, I have an ag business degree, so I can't help but see stocks and funds and interest rates and bank accounts like I can't help but have that correlation with it so whenever she's talking about fish in the ocean and that's a stock like you're not wrong given the way that you've set this up but what is the interest return on the fish in the ocean like that's what my brain starts to jump to so I struggled with that one that's my own personal thing I don't know that everybody would struggle with that but that's that's me. Do you struggle with this? Am I crazy? Don't answer that. <laughs> well, the term stock, I, I think, is a little bit cumbersome for me, too. Uh, she defines it as elements of the system you can see, feel, count, or measure at any given time. And I feel like there's a lot of other terms you could use there, which would make it a little bit more simpler to grasp. But maybe that's just differences in the last 20 years since this was written, too. I don't know. Stock did feel a little bit weird to me, but once you grapple with that definition, it, I think it does make sense. You do have to normalize that first, though, before you get into any of the rest of the book because she talks about the things that go in and out of the stocks. She mentions that the presence of those stocks actually is what allows those inflows and outflows to be independent of each other, which I put in my outline. I thought that was a pretty important point you know, just because you have something coming in doesn't mean that it's going to flow out at the exact same speed, ratio, whatever. And why is that? It's because there's this 
reservoir in the middle of the supplies that you've collected, the, the stock that as she defines it. I like the idea of the feedback loops where the flows in or out are adjusted because of the changes to the stock itself. I like the definition of balancing loops versus reinforcing loops. So a balancing loop would be if you uh, have a norm that you would, the, the balancing loop would try to get to. So your house is cold, you turn on the thermostat and you get it back to a room temperature. A reinforcing loop, on the other hand, kind of just keeps multiplying the thing that is there. It's kind of like compound interest. So this is all in chapter one, the basics. And I thought this was actually a very, very good primer for systems and uh, set the stage for me to feel like I have never understood this stuff at all in my life. <laughs> That's fair. That's fair. I, I started thinking about during this part that there are so many processes that we go through with like, just just take the simple stuff like calendaring. Whenever you have things come to you, it goes onto your calendar and then it passes in time. Like it's in and out. It's a system. And just simple things like that, if you were to identify and label what has the inflow into your calendar, obviously the outflow is time passing and then the event occurs and then it's gone. But the inflow, like it could come from a lot of different places. It's on the edge of like inbox theory whenever you've got inboxes and it's things coming to you and you're making decisions on them like if we translate it to that side of things there, there's a lot of power i think in just being able to define it with these terms like the inflow outflow piece from a specific in this case it'd be a program or a piece of information so yeah i, I think it's kind of a cool way to think about it so let's use that inbox as an example here to define these these systems and you can tell me if this is completely ridiculous probably but, <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> <laughs> so your inbox yourself inbox itself that is the stock right and when okay. you go in and open your email application you see the messages that are in there the messages that are being sent to you that is the inflow the messages as they leave your inbox, so maybe the ones that get replied to and archived, that is your outflow. Finding something from somebody and clicking the unsubscribe button is a balancing loop towards inbox zero, assuming that's the regula regulated state of the inbox system. And clicking on that unsub unsubscribe link from somebody who you don't trust and you never signed up for in the first place to signal that you are a human who checks their email, which will lead to more email is a reinforcing loop <laughs> of a negative state in your inbox system. And you could also have multiple loops in here too. So for example, exactly. if we continue that, the reinforcing loop, as we've learned, for every email you send, you're very likely to get one returned as well. So that is also a reinforcing loop. Uh, at the See, same time. Seeing people on email is the ultimate reinforcing loop yep. for a number of messages in your inbox. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so many different ways you could take this, but obviously I think you get the point. Like when you've got the main stock, there's loops that dictate if more comes into it or more goes out of it, thus increasing or decreasing the amount of said stock. In this case, we'd be talking about email messages. Or if you just ignore it entirely, there is no outflow and it just continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yep, exactly. I don't know anybody who does that. <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> I know a lot of people. One's really close to me at the moment. Um, so chapter two here, unless there's something else you want to say about the basics, because that's... To me, that's the fundamental of what we just talked about. Now nah, let's go to the zoo. Yeah, so chapter two here is a brief visit to the systems zoo. And she has a few different, I guess, setups or structures to look at. Because once, and there's tons of diagrams in here. If you're watching the stream, you can see this somewhat. But there are a lot of these diagrams, and it's kind of helpful to see these. It made me really want to figure out some way to draw these diagrams about some systems, like take the email thing. That would be kind of interesting to try to figure out 
how that actually works in my specific case from a tool base. You kind of did this a while back with, you had a whole structure of like your information in and out and storage places and such, right? Am I thinking about yeah, that wrong? It's, it's uh, actually not as tough as you think it is. Uh, I did do something like this. I did not do it left to right like she does in her diagrams, but I basically took all the sources of information and kind of followed through the whole application or resource flow before that information ended up somewhere where it would either be stored or action was taken upon it. I think I wrote that up on my blog. If I can find the link, I will put it in the show notes. Sure. But I, I do like the way that she classifies these things. And I did not redraw them, but I did take some pictures with my sure. smartphone camera and put them in my MindNode file. <laughs> nice. So I have a couple examples of these. Uh, I agree some of the ones that she uses are kind of weird. But again, I went to business school, so I'm used to weird organizational examples. And these didn't really bother me. Did sure. they? Uh, were they understandable for you? Because I could totally see a, a normal person looking at these and being like, Duh, I don't know what to do with this. Uh, it was fine with me, but I also have a business background. So right. I don't know, math and business and such, like that's always been kind of my forte. So stuff like this is easy. We used to do some diagrams that were similar to this whenever I was doing some seed research, soybean seed research, but the diagrams, we'd have to put them in white, on whiteboards because they were too big and too complicated to get them onto a single piece of paper. So this is easy compared to that. <laughs> but sure. anyway, she's got some, you know, we're talking about the systems zoo, these examples uh, from like a single stock system. I should have wrote these down ahead of time, but she's got like a single stock system, some that are like renewable stocks. So if you have a renewable resource, take trees, for example, what happens when you start working uh, on that system where you've got, say, forestry, you're logging, making paper, like when you're doing those things, how does it impact the renewable? Because it can regenerate itself, and the more you do, the less it regenerates. You know, fishing is the same. What happens if you have two renewable resources, two renewable stocks in the same system? Because that's the part that starts getting messy real quick, thus the zoo. It does, yeah. When you've got many of these systems starting to interact with each other, take like the global economy. Make a diagram for that one, Mike. That'd be fun. <laughs> but you get the she point. She kind of did. Tried to, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so there's... A couple basics here. Maybe we should kind of run through these and then I can share the examples that she used in the book sure. and how she starts combining these. But that's where things really can get a little bit crazy. So you, you think back to the first chapter and the definitions of the pieces. There's an input, there's an outflow, there's a stock, and there are these feedback loops, balancing loops or reinforcing loops. Those are kind of the Lego bricks that comprise these systems, but then they can be bigger from that. And so in chapter two, she's got a whole section on one stock systems, which is starting with a stock with two competing balancing loops. And that's the thermostat example where the uh, there's the temperature inside the house, there's the temperature outside the house, there's the energy that's being burned to, to create the heat, things like that. Then there's a stock with one reinforcing loop and one balancing loop. That's the population example. I think you mentioned fishing, uh, but this also works with, In she talks about not just the fishing example, but the, um, the global population uh, example. And I think the tree example you mentioned that is something she talks about there too. Then there's a system with delays talking about any sort of business with inventory. Uh, she talks about cars on, on a lot, for example. And then there is a, uh, a couple of two stock systems where you've got a renewable stock constrained by a non-renewable stock. And this is like an oil economy. So you have capital that's being created. That's one stock, but then the other stock, and this is the one that's non-renewable, is the resource itself. And so you've got all of these different inflows, outflows uh, in this, this diagram. I'm not even going to try to explain like how all the pieces tie together. But I think that's enough for people to kind of wrap their head around 
okay, so we have this capital we want to create, which is great, except that it's based on this resource, which we will eventually run out of. So how do you balance those two things? Uh, and then there's a renewable stock, which is constrained by a renewable stock. So you can't necessarily make more oil. You can raise more fish. So this is the, the fishing economy. You don't want to take all of the fish because then you have nothing to reproduce and grow. Uh, so this is kind of constantly a, a give and take. And then you measure it. You, you, there are other factors that go into this, like the scarcity of the fish and certain fish being worth a certain amount. So fishermen at some level are incentivized not to catch all of the fish, you know, because that would drive the prices down, et cetera. So these are all things that are happening all the time in the world around us. And I, I feel like the examples, uh, like I said, I had not a real hard time figuring out how these things tied together. If you don't have a business background though, I think you look at some of these diagrams and you're just like, uh, I don't even want to touch this. So I would encourage people if you're really interested in this topic and you've listened to the, <laughs> to the bookworm episode so far that you're considering uh, spending some time with this, spend enough time in order to actually grasp the concepts, because if it's not, presented in a way that you're familiar with, it might take you a little bit of time to kind of grok what's really going on here. But once you do, it's all kind of exponentially replicated pieces. And once you understand the basic components, which really aren't that tough, then you can see how they could kind of be put together. There was a story in our last book about, I believe it was the author was not, he didn't consider himself handy, like he wasn't mechanically inclined and struggled to fix things on his own. And he had a friend whose emergency brake locked up on his car. And he went to help figure out what was going on it, on with it. And he had learned that a lot of handyman repair mechanics, like they spend a lot of time just looking at things before they actually start fixing. And he took that chance to just look over the emergency brake and found something very simple, was able to fix it, and put it back in place. Because he took the time to just look it over. I, I've noticed like that's something I do a lot. I didn't realize that I did that. But that story struck me in that book. Apparently, that book's going to be one that I think I reference a lot. I've, I've learned that. <laughs> Probably warranted to be a double five zero. If you haven't listened to that episode, you need to go listen to it. But I found that when something's wrong with a computer, car, house, something... I spend a lot of time looking at it before I ever act on what I find. And I didn't realize that I did that at all. These charts and graphs are like that. Anytime you have diagrams like this where they have a lot of moving parts and there's a lot going on like this. Again, if you're on the live stream, you can see this picture here. Like there's a lot happening there. But if you take the time and just kind of look at each individual piece and try to figure out what it means, I think you'll start to get your head around the whole thing. Because like this thing is complex, can be, if you just glance at it, but the in, like the component parts are pretty easy to grasp, though. You just have to put them all together. Exactly, exactly. And you got to understand a few key concepts associated with these parts as well. So one of the things about a system, these feedback loops, is that they only influence future behavior, which makes sense. And then any sort of feedback loop, if you think about the systems in your own life, there's most likely going to be some sort of delay between the action and the information that it generates as feedback. And then you translating that feedback into, well, this is what I should do to accommodate for those results. So changing the length of that delay in the feedback loop can make a large change in the behavior of the system. <laughs> uh, and then the other thing that's worth calling out, I think, in this chapter is that when you're considering non-renewable resources, the limitation there is the stock. But when you are considering renewable resources, then the thing that is limiting is the flow. If you have something that you can renew, then it's just limited by how quickly it passes through the, the pipes you mentioned 
the uh, the running water is the the thing that you thought of at the beginning. I actually yep. think that's not a terrible way to think about these these systems is water passing through those pipes and because you're going to have bigger pipes, which are going to have a whole bunch of water go through them. You're going to have smaller pipes, which are going to constrain it. And uh, yeah, there's that's a, a pretty basic example, I think. Obviously, there's a lot more to it, but everybody can kind of wrap their head around that sort of thing. I even remember an App Store game that came out a long, long time ago when it, App Store was just becoming a thing where that was the whole goal of the game was to get the water to flow through the pipes in the specific direction and connect them in the right way so that they ended up where you wanted them, where where you wanted the water to end up. Completely forgot the name of it now, but... It's probably called Pipes. <laughs> the way they named some of Don't those games so. <laughs> is amazing. <laughs> but yeah, no, you're right. I mean, if you think about inflows and outflows, you're absolutely right. As... You know, some pipes are bigger than others. Some have more volume coming through those pipes than others. So it's it's a faster inflow at times. So, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I just, my brain translates weird things. That's all. So, yes, the system zoo, it's, it's basically a set of examples with the charts to go with to help you understand them in more detail. And I think that's super helpful, like especially you start looking at the loops and start introducing things like delays into those feedback loops. And as you introduce those delays, it it can cause the oscillations in the stock levels to vary widely. Or if you're good at controlling it and slowing things down, you can normalize it a little bit more. But it's messy regardless because you don't have all the information in most cases but you can't predict the future that's that's a lot of what this gets to is you can't always predict what is going to happen you can predict how it happens and make guesses as what's going to come out of that system but especially the like the higher the scale at which you step these systems into and start to evaluate them the more volatile they become we'll talk about that a little bit later when we get into like uh, surprise, like why systems surprise us and the traps and stuff that go with them. Right. You mentioned uh, oscillations, by the way, and that's a concept that comes up in here too, because you can look at the data that you get from a system in any sort of time frame, and uh, it can be hard to account for the oscillations if you're measuring. The number of cars sold one week, maybe you only sell two, and the next week you sell 32, and you can't just average that out. You got to recognize the oscillations there, how far those are from the the average, and then the way to really figure that out is to extend the timeline. So you are looking at a larger, larger piece, you know, instead of a specific week, you're looking at months or even quarters or years, but then you take into account you know, the, you want to know this specific week because there's value in the, the weeks as well. You might find that the week before Christmas, you never sell any cars, or you might figure out that the week before Christmas is when you sell the most cars. So there's a lot of different ways that you can slice this, and any one of them is not necessarily right or wrong, but you got to be able to figure out how these things tie together so you can figure out those oscillations, which was kind of an interesting concept, I thought. Yep. If we go into part two, chapter three, it's why systems work so well. So part two is systems and us. So we've gone through like system structure with the basics. She's shown us some examples and now we're kind of stepping into what do you do about it and how do you impact these things? And this chapter, why systems work so well, she's got a few, this is a, I think this might be the shortest chapter in the book, but she's got a few like terms and stuff here for why these work out uh, one of which the first of which is resilience which is basically whenever you start terming it in the world of the systems thinkers it, it comes to the point that you have these feedback loops and you have a feedback loop in that system that helps it regenerate itself back to where it was previously so as it's used or as it's impacted it naturally takes itself back to where it started and one of the examples that she has here is the human body and as it 
is influenced by, say, an outside invader, take a, a common cold. As that cold is impacting you, there's some form of an external invader trying to make its way into the human system. Your body will fight that off and try to return itself back to where it was before. It has its own system and process for bringing itself back to where it was before. So thus, it's resilient. At least, I think that's fascinating. Resilience is one of those terms that gets thrown around a lot. And we even read a book, Grit, which was kind yeah. of talking about that specific topic. But it's not necessarily just the ability to withstand change. It's basically how quickly you can go back once you've been bent out of shape, which is two very different things, I feel. And I'm glad that she mentioned that in this particular chapter, because uh, I think it's easy to confuse being able to withstand outside pressure and resiliency and being able to withstand outside pressure could also be what she defines as static stability. And that could just mean that the system hasn't been tested yet. And I feel like there are lots of, uh, uh, lots of times where we feel like we have passed some sort of test, but really we haven't been tested. And so that is not resiliency, even though maybe we think it is. It's just static stability. And then when you find the right stressor, the whole thing comes tumbling down. <laughs> Yeah. So I don't have any sort of practical advice for how to tell which one is which, but I think it's important to recognize that just because something has been successful doesn't mean that it is in fact resilient. It could just mean that it hasn't gone through the ringer yet. Take people's task management systems. That's probably a good example of this where sure. people track tasks. You have your inflow of tasks. It's up to you to choose who's able to put tasks on that list whether it's yourself or you specifically grant other people access to that doesn't matter but somehow you have an inflow of tasks coming into the system and you probably have a good way of organizing those so that you can see what it is you need to do when and making decisions on that that's fine but that system may fail and you will find yourself looking for a new tool when it's tested in a new way take the COVID pandemic, you know, whenever uh, so many people started working from home, that completely wrecked many task management systems because so many people had things set up around the world and culture of running into people at the coffee machine or at lunch. Like you would run into people and that would dictate what tasks you ended up having on your plates and which ones you would put towards the top and even how you manage them, because you would have them set up in different lists depending on meetings and you know different agenda items and such. But when you're working from home and you don't have any of that, all of that organization goes out the window, and it doesn't matter anymore, and you got to start over. And a lot of people <laughs> say, well, my tool doesn't work for this. i got to find a new tool. Well, that's not necessarily true. You're just not thinking about it the same way anymore. So that outside stressor of a new work environment is absolutely something that completely changes that whole system. Yeah, and if you want to take that example a little bit further, you could identify the task management system in a way as a stock. It's a collection of the tasks that you need to do. So you, sw you swap out the stock, the app that you're using, in order to collect and surface the things that you should be thinking about doing, but you haven't touched any of the inflows or outflows. And so it doesn't matter. At some point, those are going to catch up and the system's going to break. <laughs> yeah, part of me wants to take at least my task management. Maybe I should make this an action. I don't really want to do this, but I would like it to be <laughs> done. But I would love to see a diagram of my own task management inflow outflow structure. Like I would love to see that system. Do it. But the problem is like I'm not real sure what all the influencers are on that. So it would definitely have to be one of those iterative deals like as you find things you'd have to update it. That would be so That's cool. That's why you got to do see. it because you don't know what they <laughs> Thanks, are. Thanks Mike. Thanks Mike. <laughs> Appreciate that. <laughs> all right, I'm going to write it down. You talk. I'm going to write. <laughs> The other two 
pieces here for why systems work so well. The other, there's like three characteristics she identifies. Resiliency is the first one. The other two are self-organization and hierarchy, which uh, I thought those were interesting. Hierarchy seems to be one of those things that you generally don't want. We want to eliminate the hierarchy. We want everything to be a level playing field, yada, yada, yada. Uh, but when it comes to a system, that's actually a, a bad thing because what you have with a system is a whole bunch of subsystems, smaller things that could be classified as systems, and they're all interconnected. And so what happens if you don't have this hierarchy is that you have some subsystem with a goal way down on the food chain, and that one ends up dominating, and it affects everything else. Uh, I think, I, I didn't think about this ahead of time, but I think there's a, an example to be drawn here in terms of the body recovering from injury, where you can like overcompensate for a pulled muscle or something, because that's where the pain point is, and that's the one that's screaming and it, everything in your body is trying to fix that one thing that's wrong. And so what ends up happening is if you pull the muscle in your right leg, you overcompensate and you hurt your left leg or vice versa, whatever. Uh, that's an example of suboptimization, but I think it applies to really any sort of system that you can think about. It happens in businesses, happens in families, happens in churches probably. I mean, uh, that's the beauty about this system stuff and why I find this topic so fascinating is they are literally everywhere. There's no part of your life that you're like, okay, I buy into all this system stuff except for right there where it's junk. <laughs> it, it doesn't ha doesn't work that way. <laughs> yeah, the hierarchy piece is one that like I, I find myself gravitating towards that one quite a bit because it's what I was talking about earlier, right? Where everything is a system and they start to impact each other. And they, there's a little fable that she has in here. I don't know if she wrote it. I've not seen it before. But it was about two watchmakers who both made roughly the same watch, sold them for about the same amount, and had the same number of pieces that went into a watch. Uh, however, one of those watchmakers was becoming quite rich. The other was quite poor. And it was primarily because the one who was poor would start building the watch, but had to build them in their entirety before they were completed. And if they ever stopped, it would fall apart and they'd have to start over, right? So if they got yep. a phone call with someone asking, hey, how's my watch going? You just wrecked that whole period and he's got to start all over. <laughs> However, the watchmaker who was rich had figured out that he could make sub-assemblies of 10 parts. So he simply had to make that, set it aside, and go make the other 10 part sub assembly and then put those sub assemblies together. So he was doing it in uh, these subsystems, as you will, and start to put them all together in the end. Thus, he was able to complete quite a few more watches, thus, selling more watches, thus, becoming more rich. So, like that, that concept of building small pieces that then add up to the, the bigger, like that's our habit making if you really want to dive into that like the whole process of small yeah. things adding up to something big like that's it right there the whole subsystems adding up to a bigger system and there's so, so many different places i feel like i could take this i think you get my point though like the the power of doing things in sub assemblies that then add up to something bigger is just astronomical I, I think we talk about it on this show all the time and yet many people don't do it when that's the precise thing they should be doing. So please go do it. Yet we don't do it. <laughs> well, there's there's par suppose. parts of our life where we we do, but then there's always parts of our life where we don't as well, and that's the thing about these systems and why when you talk about habits, I agree with you like that's really what this is all about, but it's also not as simple as a lot of people profess to teach habits where just nail down your morning and evening routine and you're good. Like, I agree that's the place to start. And that's going to provide the biggest bang for your buck if you have no habits at all that you are intentionally form forming. But once you do that, then you have to extend that to the rest of your day and everything that you do. I forget what the percentage is, but it's something like 90% of your day is done on autopilot. Those are habits, whether you realize them or you've crafted them intentionally or you just do them by default. Those are habits. 
And so if you stop with just like a morning routine or evening routine, you're doing yourself a disservice by trying to compartmentalize everything into that one little area. And I think when it comes to my initial comment about, yet we don't do this sort of stuff, it's easy to feel like we do when we compartmentalize it into one particular area because we look at this one part of our life where we have been able to apply this and we say, there, see, I did it. (laughs) But if you're going to follow us around the rest of the day, you're going to find all sorts of examples of places where it falls down. I don't know anybody who's able to do it 24-7. You know, every moment, every single day, even the ones who really have done a a great job by any sort of objective measure of crafting the life they want to live by this stuff. The truth is that we all fail with it to some degree, which is actually really good news because it means that there are always improvements to be made. And when you think about improving a system, it doesn't require blowing the whole thing up and starting from scratch. Those, those, uh, Diagrams can be confusing at first. Your action item where you identify all your different inflows, like there's going to be a bunch of stuff on there, but you'll find one or two things that are going to be easy for you to change. And then that's going to feel like a huge win once you start doing it. And so you just constantly shorten that feedback loop and you make a change and you measure what happened and then you figure out what you're going to do next. That's actually a very effective and i would argue a very motivating way to approach your life especially when coupled with the 4000 weeks idea of being in the moment i feel like this is a really good spot to step into the next chapter because so the next chapter is why systems surprise us and and i say that it's a good spot because although we think we could figure all these systems out and i know that we could nail down all the details, it, it, there's always something that we didn't plan on, that we weren't aware of, and yet we don't always get the systems to work the way we want them to because there's an outside force that then tricks us and then we don't actually follow through on it. Thus, tasks don't get done. So why systems surprise us? And again, there's a few points in here as far as like, what is it that messes with the system, and we get outputs that we didn't plan on. One of those is beguiling events. Basically, something happens you didn't know was going to happen. A windstorm comes through and knocks a bunch of trees down. Well, guess what? Your stock of trees that you were going to sell next spring just went down. There you go. You have an unexpected event. Uh, Another one of these is a non-existent boundary because... Like we've said, systems impact each other. So there's not some clean little box around that system and there's no other outside influences on that stock. Like that's why I was talking about, you know, this diagram of my task management system. That would be really cool to see, but there's no boundaries to how that actually happens. So the inputs might be quite diverse and I don't even have an awareness of what those are. Like, do you get my point? Like it could be a lot of different things. So as much as we try, you can't know absolutely everything there is to know about a system. Otherwise you could completely control the whole thing. Well, this is the, uh, the reason you should do it, to be honest, because those boundaries do exist in some way, shape or form. And that's the whole exercise is figuring out where those boundaries are and where they should be. Because one of the things she says in in here is that boundaries are of our own making and they should be reconsidered for each new discussion. And you combine that, I'll, I'll say, ability or permission to create your own boundaries, going back to the uh, the Henry Cloud book. You, you combine that with the bounded rationalism, she calls it, which is people making right decisions based on information that they have. So there'll be a lot of short-term good decisions made, but they're long-term bad. That's what a lot of email is. Short-term good, long-term bad. Clearing this out of my inbox, not resolving anything, creating 10 more messages that I have to deal with. So all of these things actually, uh, I think, are a compelling case for looking at where are the boundaries 
currently drawn. They're not simple and you can't draw a single boundary around an entire system, but you can probably push the boundary in certain directions based on the outcome that you want to see happen. Uh, the other thing that is really fascinating to me about this particular chapter is the three truths that she mentions. Number one, everything we think we know about the world is a model. Number two, our models usually have a strong congruence with the world. And number three, our models fall short of representing the world fully, why we make mistakes and we are regularly surprised. And if that doesn't harken back to the great mental models, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you may as well just put a, a big neon sign saying, go read this other book. Because sure. uh, I, I feel like those three points lead perfectly into what we discussed in The Great Mental Models, Volume 1. Uh, but she doesn't redo any of it. She kind of like tiptoes up to the front of it and says, yeah, all these models are, the map is not the territory, basically. And that's why we get surprised by systems. And if you really understand why you get surprised uh, and you want to understand how these models really work, like that's the place I would point people, people to go next. Yeah, she even uses the phrase mental models in a few places. Yep, exactly. So yes, mental models is definitely there. Um, I think it's really hard to know like where to set these boundaries. Like and this is even what I've been trying to think about with this whole task management thing that you put on me now. Um, where do I draw the lines as far as what counts? Because there are so many places that things come in my own brain, email, looking, I accidentally left my calendar open, so then I saw it for a split second, and that triggered some memory, like, how do I even account for some of this stuff? Like, do you get what I'm saying? Like, the the limits on which you have to put for this could be anywhere. <laughs> so It could be. That's the trick. Like, that that's part of the process, right, is where do you set those lines? Yeah, so... One of the things she mentions in this chapter also is that structure is not only understanding what is happening, but why. And so as you are considering your inputs, you may have you know, somebody at work who emails you, sends you a message on Twitter, and sends you a text message all in an effort to get your attention as quickly as possible. So there's a system there which isn't congruent with the goal of communicating information that needs to be communicated very quickly. And that can facilitate a conversation. So what are the types of things where you need to get a hold of me quickly? You can identify this as the channel in order to do that. And you may not have complete control in saying this is the channel that you're going to use because you're lower down on the food chain. <laughs> but that's okay because you can at least have the conversation then and you could say, well, what's the your preferred tool. And I'll make sure that I have that available. And it's not going to hundred percent create the working environment maybe that you want to, to function under, but you can move in that direction. You can move that boundary a little bit. And I feel like, you know, talking about the working from home example and uh, the hierarchies, there were a lot of people lower down on the hierarchies who that was miserable because now they're in meetings all day and then they're expected to get their 40 hours worth of work done. And the C-levels think that this is great because they can just have these meetings all day and delegate all the work and it'll get done. But after a couple of months, when everybody's all fried up because they, they can't get the, the things done that they need to get done, uh, you know, they're, they're burning out and they're, they're leaving. Then you realize that, oh, this one subsystem has kind of dominated the whole system. And actually, this is really bad for everybody involved. Uh, don't hide that stuff. You know, if you realize that there's some tension and some conflict there, easy for me to say, <laughs> this is one of my action items not too long ago, lean into the conflict, right? <laughs> but uh, when it when it comes to making changes to systems, this is what you've, you've got to do. You've got to shorten that feedback loop. You got to figure out, okay, so what is the real goal of this system? What do we want it to do if it's functioning perfectly? You know, what what does this look like? And then what are the things that are inhibiting it from from doing that? It's usually not tool based. It's usually information based, and so where are the the bottlenecks for that that information, and 
how do we make sure that it flows in uh, the most efficient and effective way? This is where I think it would just be really cool to see some charts. Like, I wish there was some way to have this stuff automatically generated, but alas, there's not. This is why Mike's telling that's me fair. to make one. This is that's why. Yep. All right. So let's Do it. let's go into the last chapter of part two: system traps and opportunities. And this is kind of. I, I felt like this was similar to why systems surprise us in chapter four. But it's also like some potential loopholes in the process that you got to watch out for, and. One of these that she mentions, it's right at the very beginning of this, is policy resistance, fixes that fail. And when you have humans involved in your system, hey, guess what? They think and make decisions for themselves. And when that happens and you set a policy that you're expecting them to follow, a lot of times they're going to push back. It's probably rare that they don't push back. <laughs> take the COVID pandemic, like mask mandates, vaccine mandates. What happens? Lots of people push back because of it. So anyway, her, her point here is actually let it be. Don't try or try Correct. to be super yep. smart and do the opposite because then it'll happen almost like a, you know, bait and switch of sorts, I felt like, but not actually. But anyway, just be aware that like this is one of the traps whenever you set this in place is if you set up rules and boundaries for a specific set of people in here, like if it's a, a, a being that's going to make decisions or a system that's going to make decisions for itself, just be aware it's going to push back in some form. It has its own thinking processes to go through. Yeah, I love this chapter and I love all the different examples that she shares here. I don't think we're going to go through all of these. But basically what she says is this is a problem with a system or an archetype. That's a system that produces a problem. And then she presents a solution. So with policy resistance, basically what ends up happening is you have two subsystems with competing goals. I want this. The other person wants that. And so we're butting heads all the time. And in that situation, the natural reaction is to think, well, I can't let the other person get their way because if I do, then they're going to get their result, it's going to negatively impact me, except it's going to be 10 times bigger than my brain can possibly imagine. So this is absolutely something that I should fight to the death for. And she basically says that when you let go, it doesn't produce that crazy scenario that you predict. So I feel like this is perfect for talking about the example that I was just sharing in the previous chapter of you having those conversations with people because this policy resistance, this is one of the prime ways I think that you could think like, I really have to fight for the my way to do this thing. And yeah, you can ask for your way to do something. But even if you aren't able to say, you know, this is the way I want to be communicated to, if you have a boss who's calling all the shots and you have to say, well, fine, I'll let you text message me uh, or you can email me with these particular things. And in the back of your head, you're thinking, oh, this means he's going to email me. He's going to text me a hundred times a day. It's not going to be that bad. <laughs> yep. And so the, the most effective way to deal with this is to obviously align the goals of the subsystems. But even if you can't, don't freak out. I would argue there's still going to be some net good that comes from having those conversations. And all these other kind of problems that systems encounter, the same general advice typically can be applied. You've got the tragedy of the commons where there's an escalation or growth in a commonly shared erodible environment. You got the drift to low performance escalations where you're constantly upping the ante. She uses the example of negative campaigning, which I liked. Uh, competitive exclusion, addiction, rule beating, seeking the wrong goal. Uh, I feel like these are all things that are great to have a collection of in your notes. And then the next time that you are considering a system that is failing, asking yourself, why is this failing? And just trying to plug these things in there and figuring out, oh, this is actually what's what's happening. And then from there, you can kind of identify the, the fix because the fix is not going to be just do whatever you think is right in the moment. That's actually going to make a lot of these problems worse. You have to fight against that by recognizing 
the actual system and the the forces that are at play there. So this is one of the things that we're always, I feel like we come back to this a lot, but uh, thinking slow versus thinking fast, like that concept was yep. Daniel Kahneman. Um, with the processes that you need to go through right now with these decision-making processes, like what you're talking about, Mike, a lot of times it requires you to take a step back and think it through for the long term because we are prone to making decisions for that short term. And we really want to decide quickly. Like that's a thing that I talk about all the time that I do. I make decisions very quickly. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the decisions I'm making are best case for the long term. It means it solves things in the short term very quickly. Most of the time. Like I, I tend to do things long term very quickly as well, but not as accurately, I would say. And it's really tough to make some smaller decisions that have a long-term effect. Take, for example, when you get up in the morning, what's the first thing you do? Stereotypically, people grab their phone and check their phone right away. Is that mm -hmm. the best thing you could do for yourself long-term? It's a pretty decided no, no matter what study, what person you talk to. Regardless, it's a bad habit. Like, I, I don't really know of anyone that says that that's a good habit. The only exception being people who are grabbing their phone to turn the alarm off and then set it back down immediately without doing anything else. You're the exception. I don't really know anybody. Yeah, I don't know anybody who does that. Um, Me either. So that is a decision that we make in the short term that has a long-term negative effect. But trying to make a decision for the long term in the moment is crazy hard, I think. And trying to slow your thinking on that requires you to think ahead of what could happen. Like, if I'm going to have the tendency to check my phone first thing in the morning, maybe I should put it somewhere else or get it away from me. Like, this is this is what I do. Like, I have my phone beside my bed because mine's the one that's kind of considered like the emergency phone, even though I'm not sure what the emergency would be that I need to be got a hold of in the middle of the night. But <laughs> I don't check it right away because my wife is still in bed, so I'm not going to turn it on because it's going to light up the room. So I unplug it, and I go downstairs, and I drop it on the kitchen island as I'm headed to the bathroom. So then I don't even have an option to check it in the morning. Like I have to preemptively do that because I'll end up checking for email, seeing what's newest on Twitter. Like None of this is helpful, but that's the short-term brain trying to to take over there because I'm focused on, in that case, it would be like the wrong goal concept, I guess, is what that would be. Like trying to, you know, the whole FOMO, I don't want to miss out versus doing things that are helpful to my brain in the morning. That's that's kind of where I see that going. Or addiction, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that could be. It could be. Yeah, for sure. Because addiction is a, is a quick solution to the symptom of the problem, which the real problem for most people who reach for their phones first thing is they want to know what is going on. And maybe that is social media. I think a lot of people who get stuck in this though, it's email because the belief is I want to know what I'm walking into when I get to the office, which sounds completely legitimate until you actually start measuring the outputs from the systems and uh, you can't really see the negative output that that's creating in your emotional state by by doing that, by being always connected. So it's easy to to downplay the actual cost of something like that. But so the, the fix in that scenario, take the focus off of the short-term relief, put it on the long-term restructuring. I, again, there's the, these aren't necessarily easy solutions, but I think they are important again, models for things that could go wrong with these systems. Actually, the place to jump in is probably in the next chapter with the uh, the leverage points. So Yeah, so part three is where we're jumping into creating change in systems and in our philosophy. The, the natural inclination here, at least this is my gut reaction, is once you have systems like this identified and you start to understand the inflows and outflows, okay, how do I tweak that? How, how do I adjust 
some of that so that I get a different outcome? How do I make sure that that stock is increasing or decreasing? How do I get my stock of email to get down to 15 a day instead of 1500 a day? Like, how do I do that? And that brings us to chapter six, which is leverage points, places to intervene in a system. And she has 12 points in here in a list that are just indicators of these are things that you could tweak on a system that are going to make its inflows and outflows, the stock levels, all of that is going to adjust, introducing or uh, removing uh, some of the loops. Like all of those are places that you could adjust. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's just really the point here is like there's a lot of different ways you could do this. The, the, the main key here is like knowing how to do that and just remembering that systems can surprise us and there are traps and you <laughs> may fall into one of them without realizing it. Which I think is the reason for thinking in systems because if you continue to dissect how systems work, I think you'll be surprised less often. You'll still, because you're just creating a model for the real world, it's not going to be the real world, you're going to be surprised by things. But I also think that the more you apply this mindset, the more you'll understand the patterns and uh, the better off ultimately that you you will be. Uh, when it comes to leverage points, I'll just mention these real quickly. There's transcending paradigms, paradigms, goals, self-organization, rules, information flows, reinforcing feedback loops, balancing feedback loops, delays, stock and flow structures. We talked a lot about these. Buffers, which are the sizes of stabilizing stocks relative to their flows, and numbers, constants, and parameters, such as subsidies, taxes, standards, et cetera. So all of these are leverage points or points of power where you can inflict some change on a system, but huge warning associated with these because complex systems can be counterintuitive. And the problem with these leverage points is that we often push them and create change in the wrong direction. So if you're going to use one of these leverage points to modify a system, you have to make sure you have a feedback loop in place, which is going to show you whether it worked or not. Yeah, one of the one of the points she makes in an earlier chapter is that as humans, we want cause and effect, one cause that has one effect. Like that's that's really what we we would love. That like I would love that I could do one small thing and it impacts one other thing, or you know, my email load went up. Well, what caused that? I sent this one email and then it led to a whole bunch of stuff. Well, maybe, but there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on. Like it's not just one thing. That's the problem with this process is that like, yeah, you could, you could tweak one of these. Like you could try to increase one of your numbers. Like you could increase taxes, you could decrease taxes, like take your pick. But there are so many different, ramifications of that decision that it's really hard to know what you're actually doing. So in a lot of cases, like when in the previous chapter with the uh, traps and opportunities, like she has this little section at the end that identifies what the trap is and then what to do about it, like from a philosophical level. Most of the time, if you caught this, most of the time the answer was, don't get involved. <laughs> like, just let it play itself <laughs> yep. out. Do you notice that? Like, generally speaking, don't try to mess with it. Like, let it play itself out. That was generally the the response there. So, on an overall overall system, like trying to mess with it, just it's okay to do that. But the more complex it is, the more hesitation I would encourage you to take whenever you do that. And the reason for that is that most of the time systems work really well. And so we think, well, I'm going to optimize this bad boy and I'm going to make this thing really hum. No, you're just going to mess it up. So just don't even touch yep. it. <laughs> you're just going to make it worse. <laughs> yeah. And that kind of leads to a very important point in the last chapter. So I'm jumping ahead here a yeah, little bit. Uh, but the last chapter is called living in a world of systems and uh Basically, her big takeaway from this chapter is learn to dance with your systems. And I think that's a very appropriate metaphor. 
I am not a dancer, but I did get my wife ballroom dancing lessons for Christmas one year. So we did take some lessons and I'm still terrible, (laughs) (laughs) but I did learn that in order to dance effectively, it is a lot of give and take. You're not forcing the other person. We're going to go this way now. And for people who are good dancers, they're probably like, well, yeah, duh, that that's pretty obvious for me. I, I, it was kind of a revelation. Like you kind of both have to agree without physically talking to each other. Okay. We're going to go this way now. And then we're going to do this thing. And there's all sorts of little cues that you can use for the different steps and moves that they, they taught us. I forget almost all of them at this point. But I remember being like, this is really complex. There's like this whole menu of choices. And I'm supposed to, in time with the music, communicate without speaking to my wife. And we're going to agree on the best course of action for this. Like, this is, this is, there's a lot going on here. (laughs) And I feel like that's what she's imploring us to do with these systems is not try to enforce your will upon them understand what they're doing. A lot of them are much more complex than you realize, but just kind of go with it for a while and see where it's going. And you can offer some input, like we should go this way, change in this particular way, but where you're not going to just wipe a whole bunch of things out and rebuild it from, from scratch. Uh, I don't know if that's a big takeaway she intended, or if that's even something that is appropriate for most people, but as I'm finishing up this book, that's what kind of speaks to me is like, go ahead and make your changes. Just make sure they're little changes and don't try to drastically change how the system is functioning. Just tweak little things here and there. I don't know. Is, is that accurate? And do you think there's ever a time where it does validate just completely blowing up the system? I lost your audio, by the way. It's because I didn't unmute it. I th- I think I don't know about the last half of that, but I know that when I think about tweaking systems, I think it's really, really important that feedback loop. Like, how are you going to know if it's a positive? Like, for example, l- let's continue down this email example train. Right, if I go through processes and I get bad at email and I don't respond and I'm slow to respond, which are the things that a lot of people talk about doing if you want to cut back on your email load. Like, that's fine. But there is a consequence to that in that you become known as somebody who doesn't respond to email, so thus you don't communicate at all, thus there's no point in working with you at all. Like, that can happen. I know that firsthand. And that is something that isn't a good thing. So you can have a ramification there. So just like in that example, using the number of emails that you get on a daily basis as your indicator, that's not necessarily the right response. It's too complex for that. So as far as like, is this, is this something that's worth tweaking? Like, I think it's going to depend on the system. I, but I think in a lot of cases, it's okay to mess with systems and, and adjust them. I don't have any issues with that. I'm going to do that in a lot of ways. And I do that in a lot of systems. But don't go into it blind, I guess is my point. Like, I think it's okay to fuss with them, but just be aware like they can surprise you, as she spells out. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. Uh not really really <laughs> uh so the big takeaway from this chapter is that the system is doing just fine on its own so maybe don't mess with it if you are going to mess with it just make little changes so i guess what i'm kind of asking is do you think there is ever a time where it is appropriate to just completely take the nuclear option and just blow up the system and start over from from scratch I feel like you could, from a productivity standpoint, articulate a compelling case for that. But I also think if you're going to use the approach that she's talking about with the feedback loops and kind of the the gains that come from it, that maybe the case could be made for the opposite, that that's not the right approach. 
Do you think... Well, let me ask this. Is the point at which you're choosing to blow the whole thing up and rebuild, or not rebuild, is that system working just fine? I mean, I, mean, I guess, why would you make the decision to blow it up in the first place and want to start over? Because if you're inclined to do that, it would make me think that the system's broken because the goal mm-hmm. of that system isn't being achieved, which would mean it wouldn't be a perfectly working system. Like, that might be contradictory. Yeah, I think any system that you would want to blow up, for lack of a better term, uh, I, I think it probably is functioning properly on some level, but I think it's easy to misunderstand how the system is actually working and what function it is serving. I think a lot of the functions from a productivity standpoint, attention, distraction, et cetera, are all attention based and those variables can feel like a bigger deal than they are. So I think depending how far you drill down into the subsystems, it can feel like I'm really going to just blow this thing up by not checking my email at all until 1 PM. But in the larger scope of your information management flow, maybe that's not as huge a change as you think it is. So I'm just kind of wrestling through and this is not specific to anything myself, uh, but if someone were to want to start to make changes to the systems in their lives, I feel like if you drill down deep enough, you could make the case that you should just blow something up. But maybe the way to address that is to zoom out and understand the larger system. Uh, my fear with that is that we end up making things way too complicated. <laughs> So like the information management flow, for example, instead of just identifying, like I did, the the vehicles that information comes to you from, maybe you identify each and every person and every single tool that they use to get your attention. (laughs) And that would be a ridiculous amount of work. And I would argue that at that point, the return isn't going to be there. So I'm just trying to wrap my head around where is the appropriate scale for people who want to make these sorts of changes. My one action item from this book, by the way, also comes from this last chapter. It has nothing to do with these questions I'm asking you right okay, now. Okay, sure. Uh, because she mentions that everything you know is only a model. And so the action item is to collect as many models as possible. Going back to the great mental models. But again, like applying these mental models and incorporating change, I think you kind of need to, through trial and error, figure out for yourself what is the appropriate scale to use when looking at these systems problems and applying some interventions at these leverage points? Uh, I wish there was an easy way to define how and when to do this, but I don't think there is. I think it's all going to come down to when is the system not serving you like what you want? You know what I mean? Like, it, I think it's always going to come back to that. Like, At what point do you choose to do something about a system because like for example i have a system of making breakfast in the morning right i start the water start the pan get those heating up prep my tea get coffee stuff ready for my wife get the eggs out get bread out like it's a whole process right that's a system and sometimes it deviates like sometimes it's not bread it's a bagel sometimes it's not you know what I mean? Like it deviates sometimes, but generally speaking, it's all the same flow of events that happens. I could blow that whole thing up if, you know, the reason I would blow it all up is for whatever reason, my health changes and my diet needs to change such that those things should not be a part of my life anymore. I shouldn't be eating bread, shouldn't be eating eggs, shouldn't be having tea or coffee. Like if something happens and I need to change that, yes, that whole system needs blown up. But if there's not some big change in the goal behind that, I think tweaks and stuff are all that would change. Now, that's a very simplistic example. Uh, It is on the very, very foundational level of a system, I would think, but it could be taken at any point in the scale of these, I think. Sure. Yeah, I think think you're right, Uh, but I think even with the breakfast example and the food changes, for example, how do you know the appropriate scale? Because changing what you eat is not going to apply just to breakfast. And that one is obvious. Well, 
if something makes me feel not great, then I won't eat that <laughs> anymore. But her big point from this whole last chapter is we can't control systems or figure them out. So if I can't figure out a system, why in the world do I feel like I should blow it up? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't know how to reconcile that necessarily in my head, other than I think the the big thing for me to recognize is just, and this is kind of going back to the, my action item from last time too, is be in the moment, go with the flow, recognize that whatever's happening right now is not as great or as awful as you think it is. <laughs> and maybe just try to massage it a little bit, move the boundary in the right direction for, for the way that you want the system to to change but for the most part just leave things as they are sure yeah i think this it might come back to if you're not happy with a system or you're not thrilled with where it's going like stop trying to influence it just let it let it go like that's a big part of what she was getting at early on that one i know so that leads to the next question then. How do you think Sam Carpenter would respond to this book? <laughs> I have no idea. Because <laughs> work the system. Yeah, work the system feels very contradictory to this, I feel. The first part didn't. First part felt like a different angle of fig of uh, defining how systems work. But I feel like the big takeaway from work the system is just change the system, get the results that you want. But that almost requires this blowing things up at a subsystem level and completely changing them. And I feel like this, um, that Donna, Donella Meadows, her advice to Sam Carpenter would be that... Uh, if you do that, you're, there's a good chance you're going to push things in the wrong direction with these leverage points. And so that's fine if you want to do that. Or maybe she wouldn't even say that's fine. Maybe she would just say, like, don't do that because the, <laughs> there's a 50% chance that you'll screw things up. Well, sure. I don't know. Uh, but again, like his whole thing is I was not going to be able to pay the payroll anyways, so I may as well just blow things up. And I feel like I've kind of subconsciously applied that mindset to things. And the, reading this book, I realized that maybe that's not the right way to do it. Sure. Yeah. I feel like we're talking in circles. <laughs> that's maybe because this book has left me with lots of questions. <laughs> sure. Sure. All right. Well, anything else you want to talk about about the book itself before we start action items and such? Nah, let's go into action okay. items. Well, I was going to have zero and just say that this is something that's just informing my thinking on things. However, Mike made up an action item for me, and that is I need to write, like, create a diagram of some sort of my task management system as it stands right now, which is kind of messy because it involves OmniFocus, the Do app, Obsidian, Basecamp, like it's, it's a mess, but it's intentionally somewhat that way. Like it, it works for me. So I need to make some form of a diagram for this. And by the next time we record, it has to be shareable. Uh, I'll say that. So there should be a picture of some sort to say this one's done. I'll, I'll make that commitment. Okay. Can right. I do that? Now that thanks. Yep. So, thanks, Mike. All right. So what do You're you got? Welcome. Uh, my one action item is to collect more models. And uh, again, not ever going to complete this one. <laughs> but uh, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. I recognize that a lot of my favorite books from this year were in the vein of mental models, asking questions, different perspective, changing things on l ways you can look at your own situation, the problems that you're trying to to solve and, and overcome, which I think there's a whole systems thinking mindset uh, applied to uh, a lot of that stuff. Again, I still kind of have questions at the end of this book about what scale to use when looking at these through, but this is something that 
I am intrigued, if not fascinated by. I just got an, another book along these same lines called uh, Personal Socrates by the Baron Fig folks, which is kind of like a whole bunch of character spotlights, um, famous people, and kind of clarifying questions that they they used. So I am actively collecting more models. I will continue to collect more models, and uh, hopefully I'll have some specific ones I could share for next time, but we'll sure. see. <laughs> All right, so style and rating here. Um, as far as style goes, maybe it's just me. This one was tough for me to get through. I, I I was reading a textbook. That's that's really what I felt like I was doing. That's not necessarily bad, but it makes it a challenge to read. It's not a cohesive topic supported by a few stories. It's a academic exploration of systems. And again, that's not bad. That's just not what we normally read. And it's a little bit, I, I don't want to say jarring, but it's, it's difficult to work through coming from a different background in books, which is probably why Mike is asking me, like, how did you pick this? Like, that's, where did this come from? Like, I get it. I get it. That said, I am happy I've read this, despite it being a challenge. Just the fact that it was hard for me to get through doesn't mean it's a bad book. It just means it's different than what I'm used to, which means it's probably a good thing for me to to read. So I'm grateful for having read it. I'm glad I did work my way through it. It is challenging at times, very academic at times, and yet eye-opening for the most part, because there's so much of this that's you know, we talk about books that help us, like they give us terms to use and ways to talk about a certain concept that we haven't been able to talk about before. And I feel like that's what this did. It's like, okay, as much as I didn't like the concept of using the term stocks, like as we've talked about it, it kind of does help cement the concept. So like it's a, it's terminology that can then be translated elsewhere. So that all said, like it does help explain the whole thing. Um, I'm not like I feel like there's so much more I could get into with this. Like I'm sure there are many other systems thinking books that would follow this up that maybe do fit our normal style. I have no intentions of picking those at the moment, but because I need some space from this one right now. But I I don't see this as one that I'm going to recommend to much of anyone. I mean, if you're big into systems and such, I might recommend it, but I don't think this is something that I'm going to be blanket uh, putting out there and saying, hey, you should read this. That said, I'm grateful I read it, so maybe I should recommend it. But as far as a rating goes, I think I need to put it at a 4.0 in this case because, again, I've got quite a few qualms with like how it's written compared to what I'm looking for. But at the same time, like this is super helpful as far as terminology goes and just understanding how things impact outputs. So that all said, like, I'm grateful for having read it, but I think it needs to land at a 4.0. All right. Well, I also am grateful to have read it. I feel like the flow of the book is a little bit jarring. <laughs> it is very academic. And uh, I don't think that's necessarily a good or a bad thing, just a very different style, very different stylistically than the typical book that we cover for, uh, for Bookworm. And once you embrace the style and understand some of the key concepts, I feel like there's a ton of information to be gleaned from this. I do think that the way it ends is kind of weird. i I mentioned, you know, from the very beginning when we were talking about stock and flow and feedback loops, like I get how to apply that stuff to systems in my own life and create my own diagrams and examples and things like that. And then at the end, I'm kind of asking myself, well, where should I do it and where shouldn't I? <laughs> it feels to me very much prescriptive and you understand these key concepts. Now go ahead and run with it. And then basically at the end, she's like, but I actually don't. <laughs> I actually just leave stuff alone the majority of the time. 
And I think that's probably really good advice, but it felt really weird to hear that as like the last thing as you walk away from this book. So I don't, I don't know if I would recommend this one. I think to certain people, this is a, a great primer on just thinking about systems. I think if I were to recommend it to people, though, I would kind of say, you don't have to read the last chapter. <laughs> read up until that point and then move on to the, the next thing. Uh, the style, I, like I said, once I got used to it, it really wasn't, wasn't bad. I, like you, I really did have trouble getting going with this one, at least. Uh, I was found myself resisting getting started with this one just because I flipped it open and kind of created the initial bones of my mind node file and recognized what it was. And I, I didn't realize how much resistance that was going to trigger in me. <laughs> But once I actually started engaging with it, it was actually a pretty quick read. And the visuals, I think, are very effective. I think the examples are great. I think it's easy enough for someone, even if you don't have a business degree, because that's kind of how this reads to me is like a business book, kind of like Innovator's Dilemma, to be honest, um, where you got to kind of wrestle with some of these things in order to really understand them. Uh, I felt like this was easier than, than that one was, to be honest. So uh, I, I don't think it's out of anybody's grasp necessarily. I just think if you're going to read through this and then walk away from it and want the warm fuzzies, like, okay, now I understand how to start applying this stuff. This isn't going to give you that. Uh, had it not been for that last chapter and basically don't touch the systems, <laughs> I would have rated it 4.0 <laughs> because of that and all of the questions that I still am wrestling with, even after ha having talked to you about this, I think I'm going to rate it three and a half. Uh, I do think it's a good book. And if you're looking to add one to your collection in terms of how you think about systems, it's a worthwhile read. But if you're just looking for one, I think there are better options, including maybe my gap book, which I'll mention here in a second. Sure. Sure. All right. Well, let's put it on the shelf, Mike. What's next? Next is the book that you uh, did not think I would pick. The Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. And this is a an, another very large book, which maybe will read like a textbook. I don't know. I kind of don't think it will based on <laughs> having read the uh, the other Brene Brown book that we we covered. What was that? Daring Greatly? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and I think the approach for this one next time will be to cover a, a few of our favorite sections from this instead of trying to talk about the whole thing and just dive into a couple specific sure. things. Like right at the beginning, it talks about anxiety and burnout and stuff like that. So we'll just pick a couple of those and dissect those. Sure. Yeah. Well, after that, after Mike's unexpected pick is complete, uh, since we've been talking about thinking in systems and fussing with those systems and trying to figure out like how should we or shouldn't we do this, I, 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 I feel like we haven't done a book on like how to implement those things like how to actually go about that process from a science stance. So I found a book. It's called How to Change the Science of Getting from Where You Are to Where You Want to Be. This is by Katie Milkman. And Katie has, and she's a, a Wharton professor, and she's her, her studies are all about behavior change. That's, that's really her whole life <laughs> career focus. And this book has a foreword by Angela Duckworth, uh, who wrote Grit. So I'm I'm fascinated to go through this one because I feel like that may help with some of that process of how do we go about doing this? Like, if you understand the system on one hand, how do we actually go about messing with that when it's you? Like, how do I do that with me? Because I feel like that's maybe safer territory to cover as opposed to how do I fix poverty? Like, that's there's a, so many different ways you could do something of that scale. So anyway, how to change Katie Milkman. All right. There's that. So what's the gap book, Mike? I, I'm waiting with bated breath. <laughs> so I bought many books to give away as Christmas gifts this year. And while I was at Half Price Books looking for Christmas gifts, I came across a book called How Will You Measure Your Life by... Clayton Christensen and read this in a day. <laughs> it's really, really good. It's him, one of his students and one other like faculty person 
So kind of him as a full on academic, someone who has no experience and someone kind of in the middle. And he wrote it, I think in 2009, which was after he had been diagnosed with cancer. And the premise of the book basically is using examples from like the innovator's dilemma and those types of things that I've heard him teach before. And then applying those lessons to living a life that matters personally, which if that doesn't uh, get you excited, then stay away from this one. But for (laughs) me, that was, that's perfect. (laughs) Sure. So like one of the things that he talks about is there's this video that I uh, really enjoyed by him on what job did you hire that milkshake to do? And it's from a research study that they did and the people were trying to sell more milkshakes. So they're thinking, well, we'll make it chocolatey or we'll make it chunkier. And then they started interviewing the people who were buying the milkshakes in the morning, which is when they sold half of them. And they realized that people actually just wanted something that was going to take them a while to drink on their boring commute to the office. So they gave them smaller straws and things like that. So how does that, and then he applies that to your, your personal life. So with your spouse, for example, what is the the job that you are being hired to do? <laughs> Maybe it's not to solve the problem. Maybe it's just to to listen. Sure. <laughs> As a completely hypothetical random example that doesn't apply in my situation whatsoever. <laughs> no. Sure. Uh-huh. Yep. Speaking about a friend. <laughs> yep. Can tell. <laughs> yeah. So uh, unexpected that I loved it as much as I did, but I really enjoyed that book. I'm surprised you picked up another Christensen book. Yep. Huh. Well done, Mike. Way to way to be willing to branch out. Uh, I I do not have a gap book to add to the mix this time. Uh, however, I am eternally grateful to those of you who are a part of the Bookworm Club, because you guys recommend books, and it's really awesome that you recommend books. And apparently, there's a book that we need to cover at some point because you mentioned this. What is it, Fika? Last episode, and like somebody pointed out that there's a recommended book from like a year ago that we haven't covered. <laughs> it was almost two years ago about that exact topic. So anyway, maybe we should cover that one at some point. But yes, I'm very grateful to those of you who are Bookworm Club members. Uh, if you would like to join that membership, go to club.bookworm.fm slash membership, and uh, you'll find your way over there. It's a small fee to pay at $5 a month. Helps us keep the lights on helps us buy our books, and you get some fun perks that come along for the ride uh, with that, with some old Gap Book episodes that I've recorded with Mike's Mind Node files, uh, some notes that come with that. So anyway, a lot of cool stuff over there. Uh, love to have you there. Go to bookworm.fm slash membership. All right, so if you are reading along with us, pick up Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. And we will talk to you in a couple of weeks. Good job. All righty. You as well. Oh, I got stiff that time. <laughs> Yeah, basically after uh, after we read Innovator's Dilemma, um, Clayton Christensen just keeps popping back up, <laughs> and I feel like that's one of those ones that I should probably go reread at some point, especially now that he's passed away. But this book in particular, really, really, really good. I wrote it down. It sounds fascinating. <clears throat> I've got a list of books that I need to cover my book reading habit is starting to pick up again so thus i was able to get through this one kind of quick because we did record this one quick compared to others yep an hour 40 not too bad should be able to get it down to about an hour i mean like space between recordings oh yeah yeah right right true so yeah i forgot not everybody reads uh, a book a day on christmas vacation like i do no I'm usually around a lot more people at those times, so (laughs) holding up in a corner and reading isn't really an acceptable socializing practice. So there's that. Sure. Super fun. Anyway, anything you want to tell the folks before we go? If you're listening live, Happy New Year's early. Uh, Thanks, folks. 
Cool, cool. Thanks for joining. See you guys next time.